Welcome back to Sonic Speed Reading and Knuckles November, or more appropriately, November Chaotix. That's right, everything we do this month is going to be related to Knuckles Chaotix, their characters, and some of the related media. And we are going to take a little bit of a break from the coverage of the IDW Sonic book and the Metal Saga to take our first dive into the Archie comic series for Sonic the Hedgehog. Because this is our first time doing this, and also because I'm doing this not really scripted, I'm just kind of sharing my thoughts as I go along here, I will probably sidebar quite a bit because there is a lot to break down going into even this one comic. We will, of course, take a deeper dive into the Archie series itself and kind of how they worked back in the day because it gets a little out there. I mean, if you guys thought the regular Sonic canon was confusing, convoluted, and contradictory... Oh, you sweet little babies, you have no idea. Early on in the Archie comic, it was kind of a mess. Sega and Archie weren't really great on giving notes and guidelines for a lot of these characters, and a lot of the creators behind the scenes were building up their own lore and their own stories and bringing their own tone to the table. So a lot of the time, you would see very silly cartoony things right up against and sharing pages with writing that sounds like bad Redwall fan fiction. But I'll get into all of that stuff a little bit later. I've got plenty of tangents going in, so let's not waste any time and just start with the cover. And as you can see, the art is fantastic. Regardless of the inconsistent quality inside the book, Spaz's art really did make these issues pop every single month. We didn't have a great lineup of beautiful Sonic art back in the day, so it was always really exciting to see his interpretations of these characters, especially the whole slew of the Chaotix and this gorgeous giant red metal Sonic you'd see at the end of the game. Kind of crazy seeing old school Vector again. Oh my goodness gracious. Really highlighted the yellow on Mighty to, I guess, differentiate him a little bit more from Sonic, who is um, just right there in the front like he owns the place. Like you had anything to do. Get out of here, man. Come on. Hedgehogging up all the limelight here. I also love on the next page, every time they did one of these specials, just to add another glop of presentation onto everything. They'd have a table of context telling you what you're going to be seeing, and in this case, we have three stories to look over today. I'm only going to be covering two extensively because another one's just a part of a bigger story, which we will cover at another time. And as you can see here, we have another beautiful Spaz Metal Sonic. Just looks absolutely awesome. And, um, well, uh, cherish these fleeting moments of beauty while you can, because, uh... Well, you'll, you'll see as we get there. And before we get to the story itself, we have yet another page of presentation. Ken Penders was a really big fan of these walls of text to really build up this epic atmosphere. <laughs> Tall trees, lush fields of grass, cool, clear crystal streams of water. These are but a few of the elements that comprise the floating island, giving the impression of an unending paradise. As with everything in nature, however, there is a balance. <laughs> He takes this stuff seriously. That's kind of like how I uh, write my... Oh god, do I write like Ken Penders? And it just goes on like this for four paragraphs. For every known quantity, there's the unknown. For every field of vegetation, there exists a patch of arid desert sand. Well, no, sweetheart, if you look in the real world, I think the balance is a little off on that front. For every explored territory, there lie uncharted regions. I, maybe in Sonic's world, I suppose. And for every friend, there exists the predators. But don't worry, kids. For every predator, there exists a Chris Hansen. For ages, visitors have been few and between with war no. hmm well as you can see it gets a little hard to read i don't know if putting black text on top of black inked art was the best idea guys like i mean you can you can make your way through it but this just looks just god this is terrible i have a little bit of graphic design experience not a great deal but this is killing me so yeah everything about this page just screams epic they Star Wars the crap out of us right out front. They talk about war and rebellion. This isolated magical land that has to choose between this waging war from the surface below. It's legendary guardian overlooking all the destruction, showing with subtle confidence how seriously he takes this precious piece of paradise. And then on 
the very next page is like, GET OFF MY LAWN, YOU STUPID KID! This is what I mean when I say that they have clashing themes in these older books. Beautiful cover, epic lead-up, and like the second panel has a stupid set of <laughs> signs telling people to keep off the grass and no dogs are allowed and batteries aren't in <laughs> This is so stupid. And all the while, this ridiculous poetic narrative is happening this whole time. The fabled floating island of Mobius, given the home's strategic significance in the war between Robotnik and the Rebel Alliance. They say those words. They have every reason to be wary of strangers. Still, that's never discouraged certain individuals from striving to exploit the lush tropical paradise. And then the next page. Turns out these outlanders aren't here to pillage, but instead to parte. Oh, Ken, I've missed your writing. Hey, the sign said no dogs. Who's that son of a bitch right there? It's actually a couple dogs on this panel. So, yes, this is a strange scene before us. As you can see, Sonic and his Freedom Fighter buddies have arrived to Angel Island to hang out at a carnival. And I'm gonna take another brief detour here to just take all of this in. Just look at these character designs on display. Got a bayou-looking gator. That's adorable. Good thing there are no other crocodilians with dragons drastically different designs to compare to in this comic. You got everyone's favorite skunk, and he's just so content with himself, he's got a little plush toy. <laughs> We also have a purple platypus. As many folks pointed out, I'd completely forgotten that the Archie book had platypus. Platypi? They had more than one of these goofy duck-billed bastards. <laughs> Strangely enough, like, even within the Archie series, they could not keep the art styles consistent between the only two duck-billed platypus characters they had here. God. What I always got confused about, too, as a kid, was this spiky son of a bitch as well. Look at this guy. I guess maybe he's a porcupine, but I don't know, man. Those look like hedgehog proportions to me. I just thought this was another hedgehog. And then I looked up and there's Amy Rose, another hedgehog. And she also looks really weird there. Do the creep. And do the creep. Then you got Sonic right over there. I mean, it just really shows you how out of place Sonic and the game characters were when mixed in with a lot of these American characters. I'm talking crap about you, Sally. Oh God, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Actually, speaking of Sally, we have another weird inconsistency here. You see, the Chaotix comic was the first for a lot of things, one of which was Knuckles' interaction with the rest of the Freedom Fighters outside of Sonic and Tails. This is the first time in the publication where we've seen Knuckles around the rest of them, and they do not seem to interact with each other whatsoever. They clearly know of each other's presence, and what's weird about that is Sally's right there, but as we would find out later in the comic book, she has a long history with Knuckles. Like, this is the first time they've seen each other in a very long time, and they just don't even make a thing about it. This is what I'm talking about when I mean inconsistent canon in the Archie book. They would build this stuff up as the book progressed, and I would assume that the relationship between Knuckles and Sally wasn't quite ready to go by the time they had to get this book out. So yes, the Freedom Fighters show up to the Floating Island, which is what it's currently named at this time. I will get into it, I promise. And there's a whole carnival here, and if you've been reading the book up to this point, this is a very strange sight to see. While Sonic and his buddies seem really impressed, we can see Knuckles gliding in, and he does not look too pleased whatsoever. Sonic points out that all of these folks are actually Freedom Fighters. These are all people he's worked with before. So it tells us in this one image that none of these people are supposed to be here. Even that precious little turtle boy. Oh, yay. They got a turtle. I love turtles. So Knuckles drops down in front of Sonic, letting him know that this wasn't his idea. Get your American fan art characters off my island. Blah. Look, I know some of you take offense when I make fun of the American characters, but I did spend 45 minutes in another video talking about how great Sally is. I've spent my time in this franchise. I've earned my jokes. Don't lump me in with your pals, Sonic. I'm no freedom fighter. <laughs> wasn't his idea, and Sonic's like, big surprise, knothead. You hate company more than I hate stop signs. Look, this story is about to get real stupid real quick, but man, I love the rivalry between these two characters. It is the best in the Archie comic. No comparison. It is so funny, it is so childish, and it's so immature, and it fits with these two characters beautifully. And I love the trash talk. 
Oh man, regardless of anything else, I really miss this. And again, I apologize for yet another tangent. Before we meet this next character, I do need to let you know about this version of Knuckles. As you probably know him from the games and most of the rest of other Sonic media, Knuckles is the guardian of the Master Emerald, which resides on Angel Island. Being the guardian of the emerald basically means he's the guardian of the entire island, but his central focus is that emerald. And the games give you the impression that he doesn't have a whole lot of friends. He really doesn't speak with people. For all we know, there probably isn't other sentient life for him to interact with. They keep expressing that he's the last of his species, really pushing that isolation. That's why he is how he is. And while they still bring that up plenty in the Archie book, and he's still a crabby Xeno phobic son of a bitch. He doesn't have a master emerald in this story, at least not yet. They call him the guardian of the floating island. He's in charge of the whole thing. That's his whole focus. And there are other sentient animals on this island. So he's more like an overprotective sheriff than anything else in this particular version of the Sonic story. So while he's not a fan of visitors, he does share the island with other creatures, one of which being Renfield T. Rodent, the proprietor of this amusement park. He is the one who has invited all of the Freedom Fighters. And yes, he does look a little bit skeezy and untrustworthy. He invites Sonic and his friends to start things off with the Hall of Mirrors. Sonic's like, yeah, sure, why not? I see no problem with this giant rat man. So all the Freedom Fighters go into the Hall of Mirrors. <laughs> What I love about this is not the stupid little mirror reflections. What I love is that Knuckles is still there. He's <laughs> just like, screw you and your friend, Sonic. I'm just going to hang out with you guys. No, oh, that's okay. <laughs> Let's take a second on this page. Like any good mirror trope, this does reflect insecurities and complexes of some characters. And they do that with each freedom fighter. Rotor here is shown to have a big head because he's a smart boy and he's real proud of that. They show Tails way taller than he is currently because he wasn't known as the smarty boy around this time in the Archie series. He was just the kid brother. So yeah, his fantasy is to grow up big and tall like his hero Sonic. You get Antoine, who's known as a coward, to have this big puffed out chest so he can look brave and strong. You got Sally worried that she's gonna get fat because she's a girl and we don't like- Oh no! Girls don't like fat, not fatty boom boom, no! It's real, that's real embarrassing for the character. <laughs> and then you got Bunny, the only character who does not have a speech bubble. She's just standing silently with a soft grin on her face. It's just kind of creepy. Sonic thinks something is suspicious and yes it is, your friend Bunny is being a real creeper. She's Blair Witch and a lot of you. Knuckles, too, looks suspicious. Or maybe he's just trying to hold in a fart. I- oh. Well, if you go by the last panel on the page, maybe that's exactly what happened. Foomph. That's an echidna fart noise, if, if you weren't aware. All right, what actually happened was a ray of light blinded all of the characters for a second, and when Knuckles recovers his vision, he sees that the Freedom Fighters are trapped on the other side of the mirrors. He's confused, and is he biting his lip? Why do they keep drawing him like that? What is happening there? Well, as it turns out, Dr. Ivo Robotnik is behind this scheme. But what exactly? has he done? Well, friends, let me tell you. So, the big scheme was that he built an amusement park as a bait to lure the Freedom Fighters into a tourist trap, and then he was going to lure all of them, I guess one group at a time, into the Hall of Mirrors. When... <laughs> <laughs> this is so stupid. When they're hit with the rays of energy in the Hall of Mirrors, they would be transported into this mirror dimension, a shadow of their former selves. And at the same time, <laughs> God. Instead of having that happen to Knuckles as well, if this wasn't stupid enough, it also transforms him so he no longer has spiky knuckles or long dreadlocks. <laughs> so he can't do his punchy punches or his glidey glides. We're not going to explain how any of this is possible or Robotnik's terrifying hold on this entire situation. Like, he could roboticize all of them. He could murder all of them. These lifelong enemies and they're gone in a snap. And for some some reason, instead of focusing on Sonic, he instead decides to pick on Knuckles. His reasoning being, there needs to be witnesses to see him triumph over his enemies. So he just lets him go. He's neutered the boy, his fisties aren't as big, and he's got a haircut, so I guess he's no longer a threat. God, God, man.
These books are so dumb and I love it. So Knuckles goes running off and he's left pondering the situation. He's not sure what to do and while he does like not having anybody to deal with, he understands that Robotnik is a big scary deal. He's run into him a few times up to this point and uh, he's got to do something about it. But he just has regular old mittens now. He can't do nothing about it. What's he, what's a boy to do? What's a big bad red boy going to do? But suddenly something zips on by and look at that. It's a honeybee. Is Knuckles in a Cheerios commercial? No, it's a Charmy Bee. First thing Knuckles asks is, why aren't we at the park with everybody else? And the bee says, I, I'm not everyone, that's why. Uh, he, he's gathering pollen, I guess. He, didn't, he doesn't care. An insect doesn't care about a bunch of bright lights. Okay. And before we finish up the page, we're introduced to Espio the Chameleon. And he's got a little bit of a wit to him. With Ken Pender's classic old man verbiage on display here. Knuckles saying, well, I'll be a chameleon. Espio's like, no, he be. You echidna, I'm the chameleon. With Charmy responding, and a naughty one, Espio. Eavesdropping on private conversations. <laughs> this dialogue is something else. But we're not done with introductions. Espio was just hanging out when he heard the these folks coming by and there is a giant kerpact. They're shaking in noise and out of nowhere comes Vector the Crocodile just dancing his way through the forest saying, hey, what's happening, dude? I'm the rep with the rap for being rude. When it comes to a fight, I'm no defector. Don't nobody mess with a croc named Vector. Oh boy, Eminem, you do not want to be caught in a rap battle with this boy. Not that you'd have any challenge with his lyrics. They're garbage. He's just a giant <laughs> crocodile man. He'd probably eat you if he lost. Find the computer room! Anyway, Espio yanks away Vector's tunes, bringing him back to reality since he was just kind of lost in the beat. You know how that goes. And just as they do that, a hole opens up in the side of a mountain. <laughs> Look at Knuckles. He is, oh, he's having a day. That poor boy. We're introduced to Mighty the Armadillo, who just came crashing through the side of a mountain. And Vector's real impressed with this Mighty Armadillo, but Vector's a little confused. How did he blast his way through a mountain? And Mighty responds with... Took th through way. Tough going, but it's shorter. Sides, I had some help. Seems you can't write your way through a bit of dialogue without a few apostrophes. I guess this is just cool 90s slang. Yes, while the core cast is here, we still have a couple more introductions to make. As it turns out, Mighty is traveling with a couple of robots. Meet Heavy and Bomb. Oh, God. Why did you put faces on them? Oh, they look so terrible. God. Uh, well, I mean, I don't care that much about these characters, so I guess they can ruin a couple of designs. Thankfully, they didn't butcher any designs of robots I do care about. So Mighty and Bomb, as it turns out, are rebelling against Robotnik. They were, apparently, Robotnik's pride and joy. Mechanical mechanics designed to seek out and repair damaged systems automatically. Not really sure what a f***ing bomb is supposed to do in terms of repair, but he built them too well. For you see, he used power gems to build them, and that allowed them both consciousness and consciences. Once they overheard Robotnik's plan to imprison the Freedom Fighters in the Funhouse Mirrors, they decided to escape from Robotropolis with the power gems in tow. That's right, even in a world with well-established Chaos Emeralds, even based around a game that had Chaos Rings that could have very easily been implemented here, we're introducing generic Chaos Emeralds. These are just power gems. <sighs> I guess it was a different sort of gem to allow them to do different kinds of things. I don't know. It's, it's fine. Just the chaos rings were there, man. Anyway, we cut back to Robotnik reveling in his victory over Sonic with Renfield Ratfink, whatever his name is. Anyway, they're having a jolly old time until they get an alert. All the rides from the amusement park have reactivated. But how? And by whom? Renfield says it's probably that pesky echidna. Knew it was probably a mistake to then cut off by Robotnik. You blithering idiot. Don't you comprehend the significance of these events? Each of those rides were reactivated by a separate switch, which means... He hadn't allowed for this contingency, but he's prepared for the rebuilt Mecha so Oh, God, why? What did you do to my boy? What did you do to my boy? Look at that terrible. God, man. Oh, he's so ugly. 
He's so ugly. I guess he looks a little bit more like Sonic, but he just looks chunkier and this doesn't look like Metal Mech, whatever you call him. This isn't Metal Sonic. This is the Play School Tykes version of Metal Sonic. And look at that face. He doesn't, he doesn't care. Eh, I'm here, I guess, whatever. No Crescent Moon Quills, just, he ain't doing his hair today. You know, he wasn't planning on being out. He hasn't worked out all winter. He's not, eh, I'm here, I guess whatever. So I guess he's got some upgrades and I guess the quills are here because of the big red version we're going to be seeing a little bit later. Spoilers. But like, they have drawn him so beautifully in the past. Why would you do this? Did you think this was a better look? I just, I hate this. I, I was so upset as a kid and I'm, I'm still upset looking at this. I really hate this. Of course I'd buy a figure of this. I'm weak like that. Don't judge me. Anyway, Mecha Sonic, that's, that's what he, that's what he was called in the Archie book, just deal with it. Mecha Sonic flies off to deal with the Chaotix. I guess Knuckles' plan was to turn on all the machines to distract Robotnik while he made his way to the Hall of Mirrors. Probably would have made more sense to just go back to the Hall of Mirrors unnoticed, but eh, whatever. Anyway, they charge into action. Mecha Sonic tackling the Chaotix one at a time. Charmy zipping around his head, Espio using his camouflage to confuse and distract the robot, and out of nowhere, I guess we got the bounded rings from Chaotix as Knuckles and Vector grab a hold of them for for some reason I don't I don't know what it is and as with the game this ring tether turns out to be just as useful as Metal Sonic just grabs a hold of them and just swings them around yes the game's central mechanic just pops in out of nowhere here and is immediately useless so congratulations everybody on board that's the most consistent thing I have seen so far but with a panel of a sound effect suddenly Metal Sonic is holding on to the other ring as opposed to Knuckles. Vector uses this to swing the robot hedgehog around and into Mighty's fist, who then uses the time to reference um outdated uh co commercial. That's, I guess it was the 90s. Sure was funnier back then. Knocks him into Bomb, who blows up in his face. While Mecha Sonic lays defeated, they quickly point out that, yes, Bomb did blow up. He can pull himself back together, so no big deal. But before they can do anything about that, Mecha Sonic transforms into the giant, iconic red version from the game. But don't worry, Heavy has the power gem, handing it off to Knuckles, and I think that might actually be the only thing that stupid robot has done in this entire comic. It's, it's fine whatever he brought the power gems he's he's useful i'm sure whatever fine well, i i don't care so yes if you thought the silliness was done don't you worry because as it turns out the power gem lets you grow into a kaiju as knuckles grips it within his mitt he grows to the same size as metal sonic and i keep switching between metal and mecha you're just gonna have to deal with that and oh god <laughs> Knuckles looks ridiculous. Anyways, yes, this is quite the departure from the game. Now we have just a big, goofy, dumb fight happening. But actually, now that I think about it, growing and shrinking powers were a part of Knuckles' Chaotix, so this is probably a reference to that. Good job, guys. Don't know how I didn't catch that as a kid. And Robotnik points out that it could be a real problem if the fight heads over to the Hall of Mirrors, because if they break the Hall of Mirrors, it will free the Freedom Fighters and release the energy G's allowing Knuckles to return to his normal long dreads and punchy bits. With Knuckles' powers and abilities returning to him, with one swift, decisive swing, he takes out Metal Sonic, and with that, saves the day. The Freedom Fighters chase after Robotnik, but he runs off into a rocket with Renfield. But Robotnik gives Renfield the boot and takes off to fight another day. <laughs> And Renfield, well, they just mousetrapped the poor bastard. You know, reflecting on it, I kind of forgot that Robotnik, or Eggman, having an animal sidekick only for him to screw over later is kind of a staple of Sonic storytelling. And later on, as things are being cleaned up and um, Renfield's taken off by... Is, is that a Muppet? Is that a, is that a reference to anything? What is that? We finally caught you, you son of a bitch. They're gonna lock you up and throw away the key. You're never seeing the sun again. Anyway, Knuckles points out that this is a giant mess, and Sonic says, hey, look at the bright side. You made some friends, and looks like you got your own team. And the Chaotix are quite resistant to the idea, but don't worry, the very next panel, they're all posing together. So, this was the first ever story in the Archie series featuring the Chaotix. It is ridiculous. The setup for the story is, is just, it's 
so dumb. It's so, so dumb. Regardless, it's harmless fun, you know? As a kid, I was really offended with the liberties that this comic took, which was a pretty consistent offense I found from the Archie series back in the day. Looking back on it now, though, I get the distinct impression that the writers for the comic book got just about as much information as anybody else in America. Namely, it, it feels like all they really had to work with was with whatever was in the manual of the game. As we would discover later, Japan got a very, very different story than what was presented to us here in the States. And if you just played the game by itself, there's, again, not a whole lot to work off of here. Playing the game by itself, it really does just feel like Knuckles and his friends are dicking around a carnival. So I can see where they got the setting for this one. The stakes don't seem super high and chaotic, unless you get the bad ending. And while the story was stupid, it was really just here to introduce you to these characters. And while there isn't a whole lot of character we can really build off of from the games, we start seeing hints of what these characters would be in this rendition of the canon. Despite the ups and downs in terms of quality, these became beloved characters for Archie fans. While heroes would establish a new modern take on the characters and leave a couple of them out, it was weird for a lot of us fans back in the day to see Knuckles not have any kind of reaction to his chaotic buddies, because that's how we saw these characters. They were just here and gone for this obscure game that nobody actually cared about, but vendors would use these as Knuckles' supporting crew for quite a while and built quite the narrative thanks to these guys. And as silly as this story was, the next one is just kind of precious. It's a nothing story with another hint at the larger Knuckles narrative, but all it really is is just a game of tag with the Chaotix. And again, not totally established yet, we still get some idea of what these characters would be like. Charmy is playful and free-spirited. Mighty is strong, confident, and protective. Vector is one groovy gator. As we see, Charmy, Tag Mighty, who then aggressively tags the crocodile or gator. I don't remember anymore. Crocodile, definitely crocodile. Keep getting that screwed up. And as the three are playing around, Mighty takes it a little too seriously and takes down a tree. <laughs> And while he's avoiding said tree, he trips over something invisible. Yeah, this is how Espio is introduced in all three stories in this one comic book. He's invisible and then he's not. Ain's a little bit ticked off because he's just sleeping. And oh yes, that's that's Espio's personality, the little we can gather from this one comic. The boy likes his quiet time, he likes his solitude, and yet miraculously all five of these characters seem to have the exact same sense of humor as you'd find in one particular writer. Don't mean a bag on Ken too much. Much. He didn't have a whole lot to work with. Anyway, yeah, Espio's a little bit cranky. Vector comes to support him, only to tell him, Tag, you're it. This is where Espio runs into that mysterious character, Archimedes, which we'll get into a, a different time. But the story circles back around as Espio tags Charmy. And it's it's just a cute little story showing these characters interact in this nothing tale. There's no stakes involved. It's just them dicking around while they're bored. And I love it. It just quickly establishes that these are all tight friends. The final story is all Ken all the time, as we can see with his iconic art style. All right, look, we're not going to spend a whole lot of time here. I Again, I want to talk about this book when we get to this particular narrative, but I just quickly have to point out this scene here where Knuckles just shows up, runs to the Chaotix and says, hey, get down. There's, there's stuff happening. There's explosions and Knuckles gets up and is like, everybody all right? Sing out, you heroes! What is that line? Sing out, heroes! Jesus Christ, Ken, where do you come up with this dialogue, man? Yeah, so this particular narrative just has Knuckles running into the Chaotix while he's running away from a mysterious enemy. By the end of it, the Chaotix have gone missing. Again, though, we will get into detail when we have more time to talk about the overall story. Pender's always had a continuous side story going on for Knuckles. This particular chapter just established is that this has happened sometime in the future from whenever we first started this story and the Chaotix have been involved for a minute now. Knuckles knows who they are. But yeah, that is it for Knuckles Chaotix. The book quickly establishes all of these characters, starts to dig into some personality quirks for each one of them, and without wasting any time by the end of the book, thanks to Pender's last story here, we understand that Knuckles is their leader. That's how this was interpreted to a lot of kids back in the day. I know that's not the case over in Japan, and certainly not the case later on when we got the detective agency, but this was the crew as we knew them. And, um, you know, I mean, despite all the heat Penders gets these days, 
And despite the fact that these books aren't the best written or drawn, certainly nowhere near as good as some narratives we would get later on, there's still a lot to love here. And there's quite the legacy going forward. And it all started with this one silly book. It's way more important than people give it credit for. And despite the ridiculous narrative with the hideous looking Metal Sonic, and despite reliving the frustrations I had as a kid when I first read this, and knowing what I know about comics and writing and art and all this other stuff now that I'm an adult, I mean, despite all the bad, I... I still respect this, if nothing else. Certainly have an appreciation for it. And despite the flaws, there's just this wonderful charm to this thing. Which, when I think about it, is not too far off from the game itself. Yeah, there's, there's a lot that just would technically make this a bad product. But when it hits you in the right way, it sticks with you. And despite knowing better, you can't help but smile. But there's still a whole lot for us to talk about. I really want to go check out the Fleetway rendition of these characters, and we still have to talk about the game itself. And I'm very, very excited to get into all that, into the individual characters, and into a whole lot of other things. So stick around, folks, because this is just the beginning of November Chaos. But for now, this is where we come to a close. Sing out, Sonic Heroes. I don't know. <laughs>